Welcome to the Leaders of Tomorrow show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we have a powerful interview with one of the most original thinkers within the financial industry, Mr. Carl Deniger, the man behind Market-Ticker.org. Carl is the author of the book Leverage, which covered the financial meltdown of 2008. We're excited to have him back on the show today. We're going to be talking about the topics of politics, economics, geopolitics, and investment. For anyone who is not yet familiar with how extensive Mr. Deniger's research actually goes, we have compiled some of his most popular ideas over the years. There is no other compilation online, and it is absolutely fascinating. It can be found at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Carl. Carl, welcome back to the show. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas to you. How are you doing today? No, I'm doing fantastic. I'm uh, down here in nice sunny Florida as opposed to frozen north. So. That's right. <laughs> a nice place to be. Carl, I'd like to start off by asking you, why are bank stocks tanking? Since it seems to make more sense that the opposite would actually be happening as rates rise and they're able to generate more interest payments. So What's happening right now? Because it's happening all around the world, not just here in the United States. Bank stocks are on a major downward trend. I think what you're seeing is people realizing that we didn't really fix anything after 2008 in terms of systemic leverage. Uh, there's a lot of deterioration that's gone on, especially in the high yield credit market. You know, that is where all the junkie companies go to try to raise money that don't really have any collateral behind what they're trying to borrow, or as their balance sheets deteriorate, they get shoved more towards that direction of the market. Uh, General Electric is a really nice example of that, borrowing billions of dollars to buy back stock. And uh, well, you know, they, they went from 30 to uh, just right around their, their crisis lows in 2009. They actually bounced off of that the other day. So it's um, essentially what you've got there is those banks syndicated those loans. Many of them are on their books. There are There is exposure there, although most of them sell off that paper as quickly as they, you know, as they originate it. Uh, some of it is held on book. And then the other problem you have is that we never got rid of the derivative exposure that they held prior to the blow up in 2008. And that was something we were told was going to get fixed, and it never was. Um, Deutsche Bank is the granddaddy of that, and their stock is, of course, in the toilet at this point. There are some questions as to whether or not the firm can survive. Uh, I infamously commented several years ago that they were the one bank I actually couldn't read a financial statement from and understand because they had deliberately structured their business in such a way that I couldn't put a value on the company. And so I, I couldn't tell you whether or not there was any way they were going to survive that, uh, that blow up or not. And this was back during the crisis. So, and then if you want to add something on top of it, just recently we've seen the yield curve flatten a great deal. And that, of course, hurts the banks because they borrow, um, in, you know, within that parameter, within that yield curve, and then lend back out on the other end of it. So when the curve inverts, it hurts their ability to actually make money. And so you put all these things together and you end up with a pretty bad environment for financial companies. You know, we've heard a lot about Deutsche Bank, that it, it goes. It's the beginning of a lot of banks going. What is your thought on that perspective? Oh, I think the German government would do anything they were able to prevent it from happening. Uh, it would make Lehman look like a Girl Scout picnic oh, if wow. they actually blew up. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the counterparty exposure there is enormous and worldwide. So if, if Deutsche Bank was to actually collapse in an uncontrolled fashion, which I, I can't imagine the German government would allow it if there was any way for them to stop it, uh, the results would be catastrophic. And the problem you have generally within the financial system is that we haven't solved that problem. There shouldn't be any financial institution that can't just flat out tomorrow go out of business for whatever reason. Because what that does is enables them to do things that are illegal, not just unsound, but felonious, and get away with it. Because you can't close them, you can't arrest the executives, you, you can't punish the company. Because if you do, the world ends. And so we, had, we were supposed to get rid of these perverse incentives 
after 2008, and it just didn't happen. Yeah, they're so big, too big to fail, meaning we can't let them fail. So they sort of do whatever they want. Well, size, see, size is not really the problem. Uh, it's, it's the inherent fraud that comes from lending money to someone that deposits it back with you where there's no reserve against it because you deem some particular kind of security uh, to have no requirement to actually hang on to anything. And so I can play this turn the crank game to get leverage in a world where it's very hard to get real earnings. And I multiply the amount of money I make by doing this every time I do it. The problem is if anything goes wrong with whatever it is that I pledged originally, uh, then all of that comes back at whoever it is that's holding on to it. And in, in the case of a derivative exposure, it can be more than the original, you know, whatever the original underlying instrument was. It could be 100 times greater. Carl, has the Federal Reserve made a major mistake with this announcement that rates are far from normal and then reversing itself to say that rates are about normal? Yes, but not the way most people think. Um, last year, last fiscal year, ending September 30th in the United States, the United States federal government ran a fiscal deficit of 6.2%. That means that the real rate of interest in order to get a zero return had to be at least 6.2%. So if you loaned the federal government money, you had to get 6.2% on your bonds in order to not lose actual purchasing power. That's monetary inflation. There's, it's mathematics. There isn't anything you can do about it. There is, of course, nowhere in the yield curve within the U.S. Treasury market where you can get 6.2%. So the, federal, the Fed funds rate is about a third of what it should be. It's not close to normal or a good ways away from normal. It's in insanely loose by any kind of monetary standard. Uh, so, I mean, all right, so we go from insane to more insane. I, I, I guess once you get to schizophrenic, it doesn't really matter much what you do. <laughs> exactly. Now, Carl, from your perspective, what are the action steps that Washington needs to take to turn America around in terms of balancing its deficit? And how can the government stop from getting more and more into debt? There's only one way to do it. Uh, if you look at the monthly treasury statement, which is, it's a cash flow statement, basically. So, I mean, you, it, you, nobody ever lets you cheat on the cash flow, okay? I mean, you can play games with asset values, but nobody ever lets you play with your checkbook and get away with it, right? I mean, you know how much money <laughs> there is there. Uh, Better, anyway. <laughs> the, yeah, the, there are two programs that take up better than half of all federal spending, and that's Social Security and Medicare. Medicare is, and, and of course, we hear this all the time, that there's an entitlement problem that we have to fix it, that this is a long-term issue for the, for the government and for the budget. The truth is much more complex and yet at the same time much simpler. Social Security and Medicare are both funded by payroll taxes. The Medicare payroll tax is one quarter, approximately, of the Social Security payroll tax as a percentage. Uh, however, last year, Medicare paid out $1.1 trillion. Social Security paid out just under a trillion. So Medicare paid out a little bit more, but took in 25% as much. That's not going to work. Okay. And that's where the deficit, all of it, is coming from. So you can't fix that at this point because as medical spending went from 4% of the economy to 20%, the tax rate for Medicare didn't multiply by a factor of four. If it had, we wouldn't have a budget problem. And after 30 years, you can't go back and raise that because how do you retroactively raise an employment tax? You, you can't do it, okay? So the only thing the government can do is break all the medical monopolies and collapse the cost of medical care back down to 4% of GDP. That's the only way out of the box. And if we don't do it within the next couple of years, we, we don't have a lot of time. Medicare runs out of money in 2024. That is, it, and, wow. that's assuming, and that's assuming no recessions, okay? If we have a recession before 2024, it will, of course, happen sooner because payroll tax collection will go down. We do not have time to screw around with this anymore. It has to be done now. I've been yelling about this since the 1990s, and nobody cares because 
you have all these people that are making, I mean, it's, it's $1 and five in spending in the economy today. And you're saying you're going to have to cut that by 80% in order to save the economy and the federal budget. Well, that's the truth. And it doesn't matter whether the politicians want to hear it or not. That's just shocking that it's that close, 2024. I had no idea. Well, you won't get there because the market never lets you hit the wall. It didn't in 2008. We had one little junky hedge fund from Bear Stearns that set this all off originally. And then, and that was in late 2007 in the summer. And then as we got into 2008, Lehman Brothers, in the grand scheme of things, was one bank. And yet, that crashed everything. All right, well, think about this. Housing, at the time, the part of housing that was causing this problem was maybe 2% of the economy. This is $1 and five. That is just, that's so incredible, that equation, you know? Um, well, no, we've allowed fraud and felony to go on in that sector of the economy now for the last 40, 50 years. Uh, 15 United States Code Chapter 1 says that any attempt to monopolize trade or constrain prices or, or anything that you do like that in concert with other people is a criminal offense. It's not a civil offense. It's a felony. You do 10 years in the can for it. We have had twice in the 1970s and 1980s that the medical industry and the insurance industry went all the way to the Supreme Court to try to claim exemptions under these laws. They lost both cases. So we have laws on the books. They've been tested all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. They're enforceable. Not one attorney general in the federal government from either political party, Democrat or Republican, has brought a single indictment. Not one state attorney general, despite all the states having laws very similar to the federal ones, has brought a criminal indictment. You cannot walk into a hospital today and say, I need my appendix out, how much is it going to cost, and get a quote on it. And yet, and, and then, by, and if you could, by the way, you could go to the next hospital and say, okay, how much over here, and then decide where you want to have it done. And yet, when I need to have a, a set of tires put on my car, I call five places and get a price within 10 minutes. So when do we stop the BS that is going on here and say, enough? We either do it before or we do it after we have a depression. If the attorney generals can't call it and say, you're criminals, you're going to jail, who can? I mean... Well, they can, they just won't. What? Just, here, what are your thoughts? Here, well, here, because it's $1 and 5 in the economy. If you do this, th th we have put about 30,000 people a month since 2009 into employment in the healthcare sector. That's the internal data that comes out of BLS every month. Nine out of 10 of those people never provide a single second of care to a single person throughout their entire career. They're all paper pushers. They deal with the insurance billing and uh, all of the administrative stuff. If you were to actually fix this, every one of those people would lose their job tomorrow. Because how do you pay $70,000 of your salaries when you actually have to compete? And you've got all these people that are, are they're not doctors and they're not nurses. They're not poking, prodding, sticking people and making them better. All they're doing is, over, is doing things that amount to overhead. Well, all of that would go away. And what happens to the economy in the short term when you do that? It crashes. All the healthcare companies, all the hospital companies, all those places that built these Taj Mahal style uh, you know, edifices to so-called medicine, um, which by the way, isn't managing to make us the healthiest people on the planet. You'd think it would because we're spending more than twice as much as everybody else. We should and be really healthy. <laughs> and here's the worst part of it. All the rest of the systems are socialist and those are always less efficient than capitalism. Wow. We have a house of cards, don't we? Yeah, and it's, and it's been built up over a very long period of time. There's a lot of lobbyists, and all of the people in Congress know that if you go after this, there's an immediate crash in the markets and in the economy. Trump knows it. The thing is, you need no new laws. The laws are already on the books, which means that our president, just as Obama could have done it, just as Clinton could have done it, just as everybody before him could have done it, because the laws are already on the books, he could go to his attorney general and say, this will be prosecuted now and essentially command him to do so because that is his employee. I see. 
I see. But if he does, it just be catastrophe for the country, basically. For a year. For but, a year. But you know what? We did, we had this kind of a collapse in 1920-21 where the Fed refused to interfere, let the economy clear, and within 18 months, we were back to full employment. Uh, we also posted the largest output get growth number. At the time, it was called GNP instead of GDP. The largest growth number that has ever been recorded in American history on the recovery from that. So it is, most people don't even know there was a depression in 1920, 21, because it was over before anybody was paying attention to it. Wow. So could it actually be fixed that quickly? That, that's, that's, that's remarkable. And actually, it's quite good news for those of us who are looking for something to be done. Well, yeah, think, I mean, think about the reality if you do this. You be, it, the American business person and American business becomes 15% more competitive in terms of its cost structure tomorrow. If you take 15% out of the cost structure of employing people, then we become the place that every international firm wants to come. There's, there, are, there are no European businesses left. They all come here, all of them. <laughs> now, Carl. Some very successful investors, such as Ray Dalio and Larry Fink, believe that the government will have a problem funding the budget in terms of using foreign creditors in the years ahead. They both cite China and Japan, who do not want to lend any more money to our country. So could the U.S. dollar lose its prominence in a very near future timeline, meaning not just soon, but immediately? What kind of timeline are you looking at? Well, the dollar, there's a lot of reasons the dollar is the international exchange currency. A lot of people like to point to the fact that the United States government essentially negotiated with Saudi Arabia to have all oil transactions denominated in dollars after the oil shocks in the 1970s. Um, that is partially a factor, but the biggest factor is that our Federal Reserve is barred by statute from trading or investing in anything other than government securities. Now, if you look at the ECB, they've bought an awful lot of corporate bonds. If you look at the, at the JCB, Japan Central Bank, they've gone so far as to buy stocks, stock futures and individual stocks, which is lunacy for a central bank. But when you do that, you untether your currency from the democratic process and from the government. Okay, and so the euro and the Japanese yen have had that happen, and that's partially because you have the European Union that has, you know, was essentially a flawed currency union to begin with, where you had a whole bunch of countries that could not run balanced budgets, and Germany was basically financing them in order to be able to to export their goods there. Um, if the dollar was to really undergo a, a collapse kind of scenario. And, it, and I, I thought this was possible back in 2006, 2007, I wrote a number of articles on it. Then it didn't happen. And I looked at why, because when you have something you think is going to occur and it doesn't, you have to go back and figure out, okay, where did I get it wrong? Okay. And where I got it wrong is that to date, the federal government and the federal reserve have not wavered from this. So even if we were to lose the petrol link, which we probably will, um, even if China was to try to take over, you know, our preeminence, if you will, in being a, a you know, a manufacturing powerhouse, uh, which, okay, I, you know, guess what? Slave labor is always profitable, right? I mean, you're not going to surprise me with that. Um, will they ever stop interfering with their currency to the point that the only thing that the Chinese central bank plays with is government securities? Of course not. Will the Japanese central bank ever stop? It? No. Will the European central bank disgorge everything that it's feasted on over the last 10? No. So unless our central bank was to go get a change in its mandate from Congress so that it could, for example, start buying S&P 500 stock futures, um, I don't think it's going to happen. I just don't. I, 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 now, do, are there trade imbalances that will cause problems? Yes. But collapse? No. That's great news because you know we're hearing that from everyone. It's coming, it's coming, it's going to collapse, it's going to collapse, but you really don't think it. You don't see it. No, and, and like I said, I, I saw the, the 
potential for it in the 2007 time frame because of the oil situation that we had with, with petroleum, you know, oil going well past $100 a barrel and, and the disruption to the economy that was occurring at the time, along with what Bernanke was doing with pulling reserve requirements from the banks, which was part of TARP. It was a one sentence addition he had put into the bill that nobody paid any attention to. I was one of the few people that reported on it at the time. And I said, look, this, this could literally destroy the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency, as a funding source. And it didn't. And then you have to look back and say, okay, they changed that. That should have untethered things that didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? And that's the analysis I come up with. Not sure why it didn't happen. I'm sorry? Not sure why it didn't happen. Because the, the fundamental difference between the dollar and the other currencies is that the dollar and its basis with the central bank is only tethered to government debt. That's it. The only thing that the Federal Reserve can buy and sell and trade in and therefore use to control interest rates is treasuries. That's, that's all. Now, they stretch the rules with Fannie and Freddie paper, mortgage-backed securities, which, by the way, were illegal for them to do. They got a legal opinion that said they could, even though on, because they were government backstopped, even though on the face of every one of those bonds, it says they're not. <laughs> okay. But then the government stepped in and bailed them out. And they, you know, and they, they got a legal opinion that said that those were, in fact, government securities. Now, I disagree with that, but they stopped there. If they had, and, and there's a difference between lending money to General Motors, which by the way, they could lend you money to buy a car legally. The Federal Reserve could do this. Lending you collateralized funds and buying something that is untethered, for example, um, stock in General Motors or stock in Bank of America or stock in JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or General Electric. That they cannot do. And yet the other central banks around the world are all doing it. So we have, we have a unique position. And as long as we don't destroy it, I'm not worried about the dollar coming apart. Awesome. Now, Carl, shifting gears just a little bit. In your opinion, are the riots in France just beginning? Are they just beginning of the populist uprising? Um, have the rich on a global scale truly become so out of touch with the problems of the average person, that this is about to become a global problem? Oh, I hope so. I, I, quite seriously, um, the, the riots in France are at least on the surface about a gasoline tax in order to supposedly combat global warming. What nobody has bothered to tell anyone because they don't want to talk about it is the fact that green energy has both a larger carbon footprint which is exactly the opposite of what you want if you are trying to influence global warming, assuming you believe that A, it's happening, B, we're causing it, C, it's bad. I, I actually could question all three of those premises, but assuming you accept them, then the problem is not only is it, or does it have a larger carbon footprint, it's more expensive. <laughs> so, so you're going to do all these things, and who's benefiting from this? The wealthy, and yet the common person has been sold this, this mantra that we're going to do this because it benefits all the little people. Well, the blankety blanket does. And what you finally got was the point where the French had said, we've had enough of this garbage. You're going to stop it. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Now, when will the ramifications of the Fed's tightening really begin to hit us hard? Well, they already have. Uh, the Fed... The Fed hasn't really tightened beyond the neutral point, as I, as I was pointing out earlier. They're very far from it. They're just not flooding the market as extensively as they used to with as, you know, as much funny money as they were handing out before. Um, look, at what's, look at where the liquidity is gone in the, in the asset markets. It's essentially evaporated. You've got housing in many areas that has flattened or started to turn down. Uh, the lunacy of thinking that three and four percent thirty year money for mortgages is a normal thing is is just flat out nuts and yet that 's what you, you the people think they ought to be able to borrow to buy a house at half of the long term uh, fiscal deficit that the federal government 's running uh, so basically the federal government should be paying you to buy a house um, Why do I have that wrong i you know i mean that kind of 
But withdrawing that, you know, this is what Bernanke and Yellen got us into. They did this. They thought they could get away with it. Well, guess what? When you do it and it boosts asset prices, which it did to a tremendous degree, when you take it out, what's going to happen to asset prices? You're going to fall. <laughs> it's not that complicated. Nope. <laughs> Carl, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everybody how they can follow your work. Market-ticker.org. And you can also, if you're on Twitter, you can follow Ticker Guy. That's, uh, that's my gnome de plume on, uh, on Twitter as well. It's the only social media I use. Carl, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. Mr. Carl Denninger, the man behind market-ticker.org, whose brilliant ideas over the years can be found in a special compilation at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Carl. For the leaders of tomorrow's show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.